Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel as well as videos on the history of Faerun like this one. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week. It is finally time to revisit one of the original lore series on this channel. To update it, improve the sound and image quality and most importantly to greatly expand on the lore as I have been deeply immersed in it for the last few years you may have noticed. So today I present the history of the giants on the world of Toril, the kingdom of Astoria, the giant religion and the ancient history of Faerun after the age of thunder. This is going to plunge very deep into the ancient history of the continent of Faerun and I'm drawing on a lot of different resources some of which are pretty hard to track down these days but where I can I'm drawing information from official sources and patching the information together to provide a as clear a record as I can. This first video is basically just an introduction to the kingdom of Astoria it's uh, it's from start to finish. This information from an in-game perspective simply doesn't exist outside of a very few places. There are some ancient beings, artifacts and very sketchy, very far removed accounts from these times, but for the vast majority of the living beings of Faerun, the only know a few words of the most famous legends of this era of their world's history. Most people know nothing about it at all and have very little interest in it. Some of the oldest elven or dwarven ballads will have some in uh, reference to some of these events but generally speaking it's lost information. So let's take a journey back in time from the current year of 1493 Dale Reckoning to a much different Faerun a long time ago in a sphere far away. The time is somewhere before minus 32,000 DR. The amphibian creator race, the Batrachi, rule the western and southern expanse of the great supercontinent, Muriboros. They are winning the war against the reptilian Saruk Empire, which is now in steady decline. The race of humans, which are primitive and only emerged in the last 2,000 years on the northern savannas of Katashaka, have long been hunted, enslaved and eaten by the reptilians. But it is in the land surrounding the cold North Pole Ocean of Toril called Yaltengri, the Great Ice Sea, where we focus our attention. The harsh and unforgiving climate of this endless wastes in the Great Horde Lands were home to the divine children of one of Toril's very original first gods. From his crystal palace, Goodheim, or Goodheim, in the giant tongue, located in the centre of the plain of Jutenheim, a realm on the first layer of the plain of Isgard, the god of knowledge and magic that ruled there, named Anam, became aware of Toril and decided, for whatever reason, to go and dwell there. A fresh new world to explore, away from the politics of Isgard. He was a powerful god, but one that didn't have any worshippers on the planet of Toril at the time. Not that he really needed any. Anam was a greater god, a creator god. It is in his very nature to make things, to shape reality to his will. Up until he reached Toril, he had only created offspring with other divine beings, and originally, in these cold lands surrounding Toril's North Pole, he lived there with his divine children, who would later become the gods of the giants. We'll have a video talking about them. It was a time when truly mighty beings strode the world, and the frog and bird people of the warmer lands just stayed the hell out of their way. The North East was the land of the uh, Jutan brood, and none dared contest it. Anam himself probably would have moved on from Toril after siring the pantheon there if it were not for the fact that he fell in love with Songhild, known by the giants as Othea, a lesser demigoddess of Toril who manifested herself until that point as a vast mountain on the edge of the Coldlands. From their union, the number of sons were born, Anam's first terrestrial demigod children, and he was very fond of them. Toril was a great planet, he was deeply in love with Othea, his divine and demigod children were endlessly entertaining. What more could a powerful immortal hope for? When the last of his terrestrial sons came of age, Anam favoured them by establishing a greater kingdom in their honour. This kingdom, ultimately known as Astoria, father's seat in the language of the giants, stretched across Faerun from the cold lands to the Vilhon Reach at its height. As Astoria grew, Anam subdivided the kingdom into several regions, each for each of his favourite sons. Vilmos contained, uh, it claimed dominion over the seas and lakes. Nikias was ceded the skies. Rook claimed the kingdom's rolling hills. Otar was granted the cold wastes of the north. Masud received the fiery peaks of the south, and Obodhai claimed the cold caverns of the Underdark. 
Lanaxus, the eldest son of Anam and Othea, claimed the cold vast plains as his own and was accepted as a natural leader by the others due to his great size and strength. Shortly after the kingdom was subdivided, Lanaxus constructed Vonenheim, known as the Bilik Palace, a sturdy citadel that served as the Astorian capital for the next thousand years. Over the course of the next several centuries, Anam's sons founded the dynasties that became the hill giants of Rook, the stone giants of Obadhai, the frost giants of Otar, the fire giants of Masud, the cloud giants of Nakaias, the storm giants of Vilmos, the wood giants of Dunmore, and the titans of Lanaxis. The twisted brood of Anam's two-headed son, Arno slash Julian, were ultimately known as Etin, Runt, in the ancient form of the giant tongue. Just before minus 31,500 DR, under the wise leadership of Zalkaldian, Batrachi power reached its zenith, Zalkaldian held the reptilian domain of Mershulk in check and expanded Batrachi dominions with campaigns against the giants of Historia. Zalkaldian's last campaign ended in defeat, oh, however, when he was killed in the battle by the Titan Lord Omo. Unlike the Saruk before them, the Patrachi continued to use bronze as the main metal for tools and weapons throughout much of their reign and were no match for what happened next. In minus 31,500 DR, Astoria took the offensive and supported by the Titan offspring of Lanaxis, they seized the fertile land between the inner seas. The Patrachi battled the Jotun brood for centuries, neither gaining any advantage thanks to the Petrachi's superior numbers. For the giants, it was mainly sport. The conflict came to an abrupt end when the ice moon Zotha fell from the sky, devastating much of the lands between the central supercontinent of Mororoboros. The large fragment of the moon carved a gorge so deep between the four inner seas they merged together to form the Sea of Fallen Stars. But this was just the beginning of the disaster later known as the Tearfall, in which we now know was the genesis of the draconic species on the planet of Toro. Severe earthquakes rocked the regions for weeks afterwards. This was a major tectonic event. Crystalline Batrachi cities, though reinforced with magic, were unable to withstand the incessant aftershocks. Don't forget the Batrachi were a magical empire with great technology. By year's end, the Batrachi empire had fallen into a state of ruin it would never recover from. The impact of the moon threw up a thick cloud of dust into the atmosphere, obscuring the sun for seven long years. Nuclear winter. Without the nutrient-rich sun, plant life began to die out across the land. Without plants to eat, many herbivores soon starved, followed quickly by their carnivore hunters. Only those peoples possessing great magic or divine protection survived the mass extinction. In the weeks following Tearfall, tens of thousands of dragon eggs began hatching across Maruraboros. These precursor worms were not the mighty dragons known today for they possessed no wings, no magic, no uh, dragon breath weapon. In the case of sea worms, no legs, nor were they, they a new species of the great thunderers common on Meershulk, for they were warm-blooded and possessed greater intelligence. As the worms adjusted to their new environment, the avian race, race known as the Airy, seized the opportunity offered by the collapse of the Batrachi Empire to, by occupying virtually all of the territory previously held by the amphibians. Two distinct empires arose during this time. The Airy Kokra, uh, they ruled uh, Angkoron, and the Airy Kinku ruled the Shah. Using diplomacy in lieu of force, Airy Kokra built a peaceful empire stretching as far west as Mazdaka and as far south as the Lake of Steam. The great Kokra Airy at Vaiku governed its land fairly and forged lasting friendships with Guatal, Fay, and other denizens of the land called An Ankarone. The Airy Kinku were more militaristic in their expansion. They seized lands from the Jotunbrud and the Batrachi refugees. In a particularly devastating conflict with minions of Yenogu, the Eri Kenku were subjected to the debilitating wasting plague. The afflicted, who lost their wings as a result of this disease, were split into the Corby, who fled underground, and the Kenku, who stayed above. This incursion of uh, Yenogu onto the prime material plane was the genesis of the Knolls. In the latter half of the sixth millennium, two isolated and independent draconic domains formed. On a large island west of mainland Maruraboros, the radiant dragon Zymor established the landworm kingdom of uh, Mymidun, and in the dark depths of the Black Sea, the great sea worm Leviathan established dominion over the aquatic races. Now at this time, on the planet of Toril, the array of races were act that were active there was quite different. The dwarves and gnomes were not present. If any dwarves were around, they were still deep underground and had not yet seen the surface of the world. It would be thousands of years until that happened. 
Gnomes were not created until minus 24500 DR, nor were there any halflings around until minus 7800 DR. There were no kobolds, no erds, no dragon worn as we currently know them. There were draconic Japan champions of Bahamut and evil spawn of Tiamat operating in the background of these events in history, but there were no mind flayers. There were no only the only Fey were visitors from the Fey world, such as sprites, pixies, and corrids. Uh, there were no drow, no driders, no furbolg, none of the giant kin, no fomorians, verbeeg, vodkin, no ogres, nor were there any goblins, hobgoblins, or bugbears, and there were no orcs. Of the elves, there was only one racial group which resided permanently on Toril, and that was the Green Elves, whom we would refer to as Wood Elves these days. Visiting from other planes of existence were representatives from the Sea Elves and the Gold Elves, who had not yet become the uh, Moon Elf and sub Sun Elf sub-races of Toril. There were humans and half-elves, the Titans, whom we call Empyrians these days, as well as the legacy races left behind from the empires of the Age of Thunder. So there were the Arakokra, the Kenku, the Asabi, the Taku, the Bullywugs, the Doppelgangers, the Kopru, the Kotoa, Lamazu, Lizardfolk, Lakatha, Nagas, Troglodytes, Wyverns, Yuanti, Sivs, as well as remnant populations of Saruk, Batrachi, and Eri, all struggling to adapt to the catastrophic changes which altered the world's climate and the shape of the continent. Plus, of course, the rise of the first generations of dragons, who quickly spread across the world and evolved swiftly into a diverse array of forms. This was the era between the Age of Thunder and the Thousand Year War, known as the Dawn Age, also known as the Time of Dragons or the Time of Giants, depending on who you are asking. It was a period of great conflict marking the rise of dragons and giants, the end of the last creator race and the advent of the great curse laid on the dragons by the ancient elves, which ended the Dawn Age and the very first raid with the very first age of uh, Rage of Dragons. But we'll talk about that in a future video as well. The fall of the avian creator race at the hands of the first generations of dragons happened around the same time Anam and Othea were married and producing Anam's first terrestrial offspring, around 29, uh, minus 29,500 DR. The first dragons reached full maturity and led waves of draconic invasions, invasions across the continent. That was when the giants finally recognized that the dragons were powerful and cunning interlopers who threatened their very existence. Soon, open warfare raged between giant and dragonkind, with rich, re rich resources of Faerun awaiting the victor. The war between the two species is called the Thousand Year War, but the era of dragon aggression plunged the continent into 4,000 years Dark Age, in which the elves and fey were particularly active, conducting a guerrilla warfare against the dragon invaders at every opportunity, one which culminated in the Dragon Rage. The Thousand Year War was a no-holds-barred genocidal war where neither side even hesitated to create and employ devastating tools of destruction between the giants and the dragons. Some notable highlights that we know of, mainly from the living legacy of this time, were the giants opening a massive gateway to some other world and bringing across the first orcs to Toril, from a location deep in the spine of the world mountain range territory. The grey orcs were savage and relatively primitive and established themselves firmly in the lands above the mountain ranges of the far north, known as the Frozen Far. This territory is actually much more extensive and diverse than most players of the edition Dungeons & Dragons realise, because they've never seen a map like this, which shows a much more detailed depiction of what lies beyond the permanent storyline of the north. But Faerun doesn't end at the border of Vasa or the Moon Sea. Not at all. Other creatures that came into being during this conflict were the Bahir and the Rock, creatures created by giant mages to hunt down and kill dragons. While at the same time, the war between Bahamut and Tiamat placed greater and greater pressure on the dragons as each side created new draconic beings to bolster their side of the conflict, which was gradually becoming a very serious civil war that would see their entire race split into the factions that persist to this day, the evil uh, chromatics, the neutral drag gems, and the good metallics. Dragons created a lot of magic items to aid them in their fight, which you don't see much of in 5th edition either, but in earlier editions there are a lot of them. Mostly you will see orbs and rods and rings and such, but there are other magical items only suitable for dragons to wear and use. Dragons also developed a lot of metamagic involving uh, their breath weapons, which almost always, well, basically provided them with as much utility as wizard spell magic does. Astoria grew to become the Colossal Kingdom, with a seat of power originally being this bleak citadel built by Lanaxis, which the giants called 
Vonenheim or Titanheim. Located in the uh, the ice spires, for a thousand years it was the capital of the giant kingdom. It eventually was lost under massive sheets of ice when the northernmost part of Faerun began to freeze over, but more on that in a later video. After more than a thousand years of warfare, Astoria finally reached a truce with Dragonkind. Accounts of the truce and its origins vary. According to ancient dwarven manuscripts, the dragon sued for peace in order to prepare for a great civil war that led to the separation of their kind. According to the text of Ballads of the Giants, on the other hand, Anam and the dragon god played a game of Wari to settle the game, the game ending in a stalemate. By the time the dragon war against uh, dragon the the war against dragonkind concluded, Astoria had shrunk to only a shadow of its former self. On the day of the truce was declared, the nation of giants occupied only the northernmost edge of Faerun and the areas now known as the Savage North and the Cold Lands. Many giant strongholds and structures remained behind all across the continent though. I have a whole video talking about the history of Iron Fang Keep for instance, which was one of their outposts. During the Thousand Year War, other events were playing out though, such as the beginning of the Draco Holy Wars, with religious factions among dragons fighting over the different philosophies, particularly among the followers of Asgarath, the primal draconic creator god. Well, according to his followers, there's some mystery with that deity, also known as Io, not to be confused with the overgod of Toril named Ao, which, fun fact, was not a creation of Ed Greenwood, the creator of the Forgotten Realm setting. Ao was an addition by put into the setting by the folks at TSR Games, as was the idea that Ao answers to a master, the dungeon master. The giants have a particularly fractious religion as well, all of which, uh, all of the giant breeds worship the same few gods, each has its own unique set of ideas of what each god represents. Thus, there is often as much difference of opinion between the faithful of a single sect as between the devotees of two rival sects. In fact, during the long history of their kingdom, entire wars have been fought among rival worshippers of a single divine being. Although each tribe continues, uh, confines the bulk of its active worship to one or two patron deities, most giants revere all of the various giant gods. Giants routinely enter shrines to, to dedicate their tribe's patron deity and offer prayers to another member of the ordining. Such conduct is perfectly acceptable. Any giant temple can be used as a place of worship for any legitimate giant god. In fact, all giant priests are educated together and receive almost no indoctrination that extends beyond general beliefs and customs pertaining to the whole set of the ordining. When it comes to the specific festivals and practices linked to the patron deity, the giants priests are called upon to invent their own using the general training as a rigid guideline. It's all about the ceremony and the situation really. Sitting atop the entire hierarchy of giant priests and shamans is the Stormazin, the great priest of Arnhem. Uh, the Stormazin is always a high, male high priest of the highest level. His duties include tending to Anam's great temple, currently located in the Ice Spire Mountains, traveling to each of the giant steadings to participate in important rituals and ceremonies, resolving disputes between pr uh, priests, maintaining and revisiting and revising the code of conduct for the clergy, and training new priests. Although the Stormazin has no official sanction to establish policy that falls outside of the religious arena, he's always a highly respected figure within giant society. Most chieftains tend to accept his advice, particularly since he traditionally offers it so sparingly, and to openly insult the Stormazin is a fairly disastrous political move in relation to all the other giant steadings. Stormazins hold the title for life. When the Stormazin dies, the high priests of all the great tribes gather together and elect one of themselves to the office. It was actually one of the dragon pantheon that kicked off the whole full-on war of the giants though. The dragons definitely shot first. The war began in minus 26,000 DR when the dra dragon god of fire destruction and renewal named Garrix sent an avatar to lead a flight of red dragons to attack Astoria openly and directly. Soon afterward, all races of dragonkind were embroiled in the conflict, but it was Garrix who was the driving force behind the dragon aggression, from the start to the actual finish of the war. As mentioned, the war saw many innovations on both sides. The giants created a powerful super colossus construct called Vonendod to help them in the fight against the dragons. The battles acquired such epic scope that they have become the source of inspiration for many of the most treasured classical ballads of the giant skalds, as well as dragon and el uh, dwarven and elven folklore, and songs that are among their most ancient and form the basis of a lot of the stories that they tell these days, kind of like The Lord of the Rings was based on the, the saga of Sigurd. One of the most renowned heroes of the war was giant uh, named 
Hrona Wormreva, who killed many dragons single-handedly and was reputed to have challenged Tiamat herself to a contest of riddles. He lost the contest, though. As a penalty, penalty, a severe penalty, he had to do nothing to prevent the evil dragon goddess Tiamat devouring one of his own children. He later died in battle against a dragon king. There are a couple of accounts of how the war ended. One states that due to the dragon civil war between metallic and chromatic kind, Garrix and Anam actually settled the war with single game of Wari, as I mentioned, complicated chess-like board game, which ended in a stalemate. What is more likely, though, is another account that Tiamat slew an unknown giant, giant deity and was struck with a super potent curse that bound her to a region now known as Tiamat's lair in the plain of Avernus, where she could not leave unless she was summoned from there with a specific and powerful ritual. Some sages believe that if Tiamat were to be successfully summoned back to the Prime Material Plane permanently, it would result in the end of the truce and the return of hostilities between the two races. And considering that giants have fared a little less well than dragons, I think the end would probably be a foregone conclusion. After the end of the conflict, the giants dismantled the construct of Onodod, but by the time the war concluded, Astoria had been reduced to a shadow of its former self. On the day the truce was declared, the nation occupied the, the northernmost edge of Faerun only. The area is now known as the Great Glacier, the Cold Lands, and the Savage North. This is not the end of Astoria, though. It took the artifact-based environmental disaster freezing over the northern lands to do that. Though to tell that story, we need to talk about the infidelity of Othea and the arrival of the giant kin. But for now, that makes a good entry point to our video series on the giants of Faerun. If you like what I do, please hit this button, uh, the like button, and if you've made it this far, subscribe. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise. We're your Geek With Pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.